The All Black Podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black become the best run teams in sport. To listen to this episode and all the All Black Podcasts, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Kira Fano, welcome to the All Black Podcast, powered by SAP. Awesome pod today as we chat to one of the great characters of New Zealand rugby who has literally done it all from the grassroots to the All Black jersey, zooming in from Paris where he has started a new chapter in his rugby career. Welcome to the All Black Podcast, Brad Weber. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. It's good to finally get on this thing. Mate, Seen a few it- other lads. On. Yeah, totally, and we've sort of um, been ships in the night a little bit, but I actually quite like the fact that uh, we didn't get it done while you were here, and now we're zooming in from from your new chapter. And, and firstly, I wanted to ask you, you know, like I can imagine a transition from the Tron, from Hamilton, um, over to Paris is was probably probably seamless. You know, no doubt many similarities uh, in the Parisian capital. Yeah, definitely, certainly pretty similar people rolling around, <laughs> similar landmarks. <laughs> I've already found myself a house on hood. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she's she's pretty. Yeah, she's it, it's been it's been good um, getting over here. The first couple of weeks were tough. I won't lie. It's uh, the, the the language barrier sort of um, you know gets you. I don't know. It just makes settling in a little bit little bit tougher. And um, yeah, I did classes and stuff before I rolled over, but nothing quite prepares you for people talking it uh really fast and uh, <laughs> uh yeah but it's it's cool mate i've got you know i've got also i'm in my apartment at the moment i've got a little um uh, a little couple of bedroom apartment here right, right near the city the city's just just down there i can see the Eiffel tower from my apartment so it's it, it's pretty cool and, and the setup at stud front say is, is is pretty phenomenal man it's uh like you know we're, we're pretty humble um up at the, the chiefs our sort of setup up there so it's uh, yeah, it's it's been pretty eye opening seeing what um, a fair bit of money can 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 buy a club around here, mate. It's it's sort of been, you know, I'm just having a look at been what you're up to. You you you're throwing straight in the deep end, aren't you? Like you sort of like you say, you come out in New Zealand rugby, a um, little bit of sunshine, some pop up around here, flick over to the European winter, and you're straight into it. You're playing footy, um, and actually some pretty, you know, starts a big club, and you play in a pretty um, competitive competition, whether it be. Uh, the French top 14 or whether it be the European Cup and, and you're into it aren't you it's sort of sink or swim how's it been like you know what's a how do you say box kick in France or taxi in France like how do you say how does the you know is the international language of rugby doing its job yeah they've got um there's a couple of I guess like in amongst our game plan like some words are in English and some are in French so I've just <laughs> kind of been I guess like rugby language is whatever team new team you go to you're, you're learning a new language yeah. Uh, you know all the calls and stuff anyway so that's but it's just if anything it's just getting used to uh the French accent to be honest um <laughs> you know, we've got calls like uh tango and um geez what else like turbo and stuff and like li- listening to their accent has been quite hard to to get but yeah thrown pretty much straight in there mate um uh, I think when we had a uh, my first start we uh, had a quite a big loss against against Poe and everyone was down and thinking we were terrible and then um, the next week we we beat Toulouse at home um, in front of like twenty thousand screaming Parisians, which is pretty cool. And um, all of a sudden we're, we're we're a good team again. So it's uh, yeah, it's been it's been interesting, but it's been cool, mate. Um, of you know you have like European comp is and certainly the top fourteen is is probably you know arguably one of the best comps in the, in the world at the moment, yeah, totally. and um, you know, playing against some of the best players in the world at the moment. Um, so I still get to tick that um, competitiveness uh, playing in this comp. And um, yes, yeah, mate, she's she, she's pretty good. And uh, certainly, uh, I'd heard a bit. There's some big players over here, mate. Some some of the boys are, 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 are huge, <laughs> um, but it's probably probably not as not as fast as say Super Rugby. Um, certainly there are uh, passages of play which are are long and and still tiring but um, you know what I've loved about stud so far is um, you know they obviously they've encouraged me to still play fast which obviously I love I love just playing up tempo and play quick they really want this team to to get there Um, but obviously I've got to throw in a little bit more probably um, game sense a little bit more kicking uh, in here and there that I'm probably used to so um, yeah just transitioning to that sort of stuff at the moment. But I suppose on the rugby side of things, that's cool, isn't it? Like it's a new challenge. You've got a you can't just one hundred percent 
um, come in and do it your way or say do it the way we've I've heard a lot of Kiwis say that in the past that sometimes you've not swallow your pride but you've got to you can't think you got to go there and, and do it your way you've got to um, adapt to what the team does and the style of rugby and like you say the um, you know that'll take a little bit of time but hopefully you're an experienced player but on the other side of it like you say it's cool isn't it like you were saying before the game you get uh, you know there's there's actually a lot of hype around the games it's a pretty cool match day like there's a lot of things that that happen that are that are new and exciting and and you know have you got some Kiwis in your team or overseas guys in your team that you can sort of share a coffee with and speak English with for for ten minutes before you get back in the mix? Yeah, so there's um there's one Kiwi here. No uh, no one will probably have heard of him on oh well uh, rugby fans anyway. His name's Giovanni Havukufna. He's he's from Taranaki, but he's been there since. Oh, that's he's awesome. Yeah, yeah, but he's been there since he was eighteen or nineteen, so he's been here a long time. Fu- fully fluent in French, he's basically my translator as well. Which has been quite <laughs> um, and then we've got a couple of Englishmen. Joe Marchant has just come here from oh, yeah. Harlequin. Yep. Um, Henry's a ten who's been here a while, and um, a couple of South Africans, a couple of Australians thrown in here and there. So it's a real eclectic bunch of uh, of foreigners and in, in, in the crew. A couple of Fijians, as there always is, in just about every French team. So. Um, but good, real good crew of, of foreigners, which has helped the transition big time. They've just been, uh, just yeah, in terms of being able to show me around and how, how it all works, a couple of translators uh, on the go is, is is pretty handy. And yeah, mate, the the match day um, stuff is is pretty impressive. I guess it's probably stems from a lot of uh, the football background, but yeah. it's uh, the 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 crowd are, is pretty crazy. You get dropped off about two or three hundred meters away from the change room. You have to walk through just a corridor of full of full of fans uh, at our at our stadium. They they drop pink and blue uh, flares that are going off. So you're walking through the smoke. They're banging drums. It's it's pretty crazy. I hear they get pretty feral down south to opposing teams. I haven't experienced that yet, but uh, I'm sure I will. It's probably a good thing I don't quite understand French yet, because I won't uh, <laughs> understand the abuse they're hurling at my way. But got that to look forward to as well. Uh, mate, it, it sounds pretty cool. And perhaps you need to do a, a follow-up pod in a year when you're fluent in French. You're sort of running the, <laughs> the Dan Carter wardrobe. You know, you've become fully accustomed to <laughs> Paris lifestyle. But, mate, let's do a few warm-up questions to start off. Like, um, for you, mate, favourite player growing up and why? Um, I used to love uh, Christian Cullen. Um, he's just, yeah, just phenomenal the way he ran and stuff. Um, but certainly, as, probably as a, as a halfback, I probably looked more overseas as to... Like so George Gregan and Augustine Peashot, I like those two. Yeah. Um, I sort of certainly grew up in a time where the nines were a little bit bigger, guys like Justin Marshall and Byron Callagher and stuff. So sort of looked overseas for guys that were probably more inspirational for a for a little man like myself. I like those two. Mate, a couple of great players there, like especially Gregan. He geez, he was yeah. influential. Mate, what about for you? Who was influential in your rugby career growing up? Who helped you sort of carve a bit of a path? Uh it's, it's Obviously, for me, it's, it's my dad and my granddad. So um, they both played halfback for for the Magpies for Hawks Bay. So I'm a third generation uh, Magpies halfback, which is pretty cool. And um, I I grew up um, obviously growing up in Hawks Bay. Um, all I ever wanted to do was, was was play for the Magpies. I didn't really have a Super Rugby team. I followed um, the Magpies were it for me. So um, it was pretty cool when I finally got there. I certainly grew up watching. Uh, the VHS tape, which is probably a few for- <laughs> be foreign to a few uh, few young listeners, uh, what a VHS tape is, but uh, of the 1993 um, Hawks Bay Magpies win over the British and Irish Lions, my, my dad played halfback that day and he scored a try, which he's, uh, he's pretty proud of. So I would have watched that tape about 50 times. So, oh, yeah, mate, mate those two were pretty pretty inspirational for me. Yeah, good. That was sort of new Norm Hewitt days, wasn't it? And there's um, that's got to be – that's a stat, isn't it? Like, I can't think of – uh, you know, too many other third generation first class rugby families, but also in the same position. Like that, they'd have to be have to do a bit of research there. But that is that is an outstanding stat, isn't it? Like it's brilliant. And was it the um was the old man and granddad pretty happy to tell you when you were going good and also when you were going bad? You know, there's plenty of um you know feedback there. Good old fashioned family feedback. Dad's um dad's probably pretty positive. I think he's like pretty biased into how I play, and like <laughs> he's always, he's always in my corner thinking I'm. I'm going pretty hot, um, but Granddad was definitely Granddad was definitely the, the critic of of the two. He'd uh, he'd always ring me up and um, he'd fo- if, yeah he'd follow me around a fair bit, but he'd always he'd always start with the good stuff um, and then always finish with the stuff that I need to work on. He was pretty brutally honest too, um, my Granddad. But he was he he coached my dad and stuff, so I think he's uh, he's pretty used. To, it's, 
talking to my dad and some of his mates, apparently he was a bit of a hard man as a coach too. So I, yeah, I certainly brought the brunt of that in the, the um, last few years of his life. <laughs> Mate, that, that is outstanding. There's got to be a um, surely. There's got to be a, a family photo of of three Webers and Magpie jersey somewhere. There must be, mustn't there? There might be somewhere. I know I come up and played um, for Otago against the Magpies, um, and there was like a photo in the paper, and it was us three. Um, obviously, I had my Otago kit on though. So, um, unfortunately, Granddad um, passed away before oh. I actually played the Magpies. So that's that. That's unfortunate. But I'm sure. Could Photoshop something together. Yeah, yeah. Well, three three jerseys on the wall would be pretty special in the lounge or something, wouldn't it? Alongside yeah. each other from the generations. That's 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 awesome. Um, best player you've played with and against? Oh well, it's a it's a good question. Tough one. Uh, May I played with so many good players. Um, but for me, it's probably Damian McKenzie actually. Yeah, cool. Uh, I just think he's. Certainly in the last 12 months, how much of an all-round player is. We obviously see that just the freakish skills he's got, you know, the the length of kick, the accuracy of it, the the different um, types of – and his run kick pass uh, threats is just freakish. Still don't really know what he's doing when he's going on those <laughs> runs, but, but I love it. And certainly – and really also what people probably underestimate with Damien is how strong and how powerful he is, certainly in the gym and on, on the field. And just a really brave defender, some a guy that I've loved, uh, you know, smacking a few big boys over with <laughs> in my time. And I just, yeah, I think he's pretty special, man. Mate, it's it's pretty impressive when some big units come down his channel. How much he holds up, eh? Like it's it's actually, and he's one of those ones where people are, oh, he looks small on the TV because he's amongst all these big guys. He actually, yeah. is pretty small in person as well, to be honest. You know, yeah. but he still <laughs> still holds up. And how he can kick it so far is. Um, Shows, like you say, his explosiveness, his technique, and and yeah, I've heard good things about you know how he's maturing as a player over the last twelve months as well. So pretty exciting for him, isn't it? Next year to maybe have more of an opportunity to to get in the black jersey maybe and and steer the boys around. What about um what about guys against mate? Was there anyone, whether it be the Chiefs um or the All Blacks, where there's some particularly aggressive scouting, just making sure that um we're prepared for what came? I mean, I I, I was lucky enough, but I was probably young and didn't play a lot against so I played against like your your D set, your Dan Carters and your Richie McCalls and stuff, but they're sort of at the end of their their career and probably didn't play a lot uh when I was when I was playing. So but they would probably be obvious ones, but um certainly guys like um guys like Bodie Barrett when he was at his best uh was, was he was pretty he was pretty tough to to handle. He's a bit like I guess a little bit like Damien really. Yeah. Um off the cuff yeah, sometimes. All, yeah, and the speed and, and the running and passing and kicking abilities. He was pretty certainly I remember the Hurricanes days, he was he was bloody tough to to, to defend against, mate. He, he, as much planning in the world can go into it. Yeah. And, um sometimes you just can't stop freaks. Freaks and speed are weapons, aren't they? There's um what about, you know, you're lucky enough, huge career now, like, you know, spanning, you know, mm. over ten years, like best and worst tourists you know like who who's it who's it good to who's it good to get on the bus with and and who are you um you know who are you walking past jeez that's could, could probably end a few careers with the, uh, <laughs> oh happily do mate you're, you're in france now so no issues <laughs> yeah. no I'll, um there's certainly a couple of good ones i mean guys like angus tartaval so much energy he's pretty he's pretty good pretty good value um bodie barrett with all his um his golfing yeah uh, you know he's got contacts everywhere to every just about every golf course in the world. I swear he could get you onto Augusta National if you, <laughs> if you try hard enough. But uh, so those two are always good, and um, yeah, there's, oh, there's always a couple of bad ones, right? Uh, like as much as I love my mate Stephen the Beaver Donald, um, he was he was tough to room with at times, just just purely for the fact uh, how how often he's rolling in around nude, and uh, you know he can. And because of that, he makes you feel a little bit inadequate. Yeah, just too comfortable in his own skin, is he? Just too comfortable. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. So, so the, I've seen enough of, of that man um, for one. So I'm glad he's on. He's on basically on on your side now on the uh, on the radio and the interviewing side of things. So totally, mate. A man he's... who wears uh, mini hats does these days does be, but doesn't he? He's got yeah. a huge capacity to get stuff done, doesn't he? Like his head yes. is attached. His ear is attached to that phone. Um, mate, if it wasn't rugby, you know what? What profession do you think you'd be in today if, if um, you know, the professional rugby door had closed when you were 20 years old? What would we yeah. be talking to Spud Weber about today? 
Yeah, so I was doing a applied science degree in at Otago Uni, um, and I was going specialising in um, technology, sport technology, and um, I really I was going into my last year when I got brought up to the chief, so I, I didn't quite get to finish it off. But I'd, there's a company in Dunedin that do a lot of um, TV technology with with, oh. with sport around um, a lot of ball tracking golf. Oh, they they do a lot of the stuff for the big tours, don't they? Like they're responsible yeah. for all that graphics and yeah, yeah ball tracking. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, and I think they did. They might have done the America's Cup and stuff like that. Yeah. So that, that sort of stuff really interested me at the time. So I would have liked to think I would have uh, tried to link up with with those guys and maybe have uh, done stuff like that. Um, that's probably the the track I would have gone down. And certainly nowadays, it's I probably I've forgotten a lot of the stuff that I learned at uni back then. The rugby career's been a bit longer than I expected, so uh, probably might not go back to it. But you know, who knows? Maybe. Uh, Maybe some DJing, or maybe maybe I'd love to. I'd love to get into the TV, maybe uh, one day, and maybe um, maybe go down that track, run my own show. NZR Plus, actually, yeah. NZR Plus. Well, um, look, there's maybe, opportunities. Maybe they'll be in the. They might be in the market for a uh, for a new TV show. Mate, Who knows? Uh, I think so. I, I think um, you're pretty good on the mic, to be honest. Like, is there any? Um, you know, if you're pitching that sort of show, is there any guys um, that you take along with you that think are good characters? Are you the host, mate? Are you driving it, or are you the color man? Like, what what does that look like? Yeah, so I'm, in my head, I'm probably thinking it's it's very Maddie John's show esque. Great show, um, great show, great show. Maybe the Brad, you know, maybe the Brad Weber show. Who oh, knows? Oh. Um, the open suggestions for names, but yeah, I think I'm like the conductor, yeah. the host. I'm sort of piecing it all together, yes. throwing to guys, you know, making sure it's all running smoothly. And then um, I'm probably getting guys like Angus Tartavell on. Yeah, he's um, good. Maybe, maybe maybe Joe Wheeler as well. Maybe pair yes. those two together. Yeah, um, they could be Fletch and Hindies. Is yeah. sort of where I'm. Let's let them be creative. Go out to the Super Rugby teams during preseason. Yes. Let them do as much videos, funny videos, and, yep. and stuff with players. Um, All Blacks when they come in, they jump in there, do their thing. Um, just let them go wild. Let their creative juices flow, and um, sort of see where it takes you. And then you know, you maybe you record it on a Sunday avo, get a player yep. in, much like they do, and yeah. Because like, as much as I love the breakdown, it's uh, it's very serious. Yeah, and uh, probably for that sort of uh, that, that type, but I'd like something a little bit more low key, a little bit more fun, where you can uh, have a bit of a laugh and and showcase a few of the the player, the current players' uh, real personalities, which is uh, what I love doing. Mate, I like the sounds of that. We might just clip up this part of the pod and and just flick yeah. it off to Sky and 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 let yeah. them um, know your thoughts. But that that excites me. That excites me a lot. Is uh, mate, what about Best non-rugby sporting moments. So you've had plenty of fantastic moments on the footy field, and we're going to chat about those. But what about away from the footy field? Because I know you love your sport. Um, is there anything yep. else that that really sticks out? Hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty easy, actually. I was going to. The Chiefs actually did. Um, we created a, a cricket team. Last summer, <laughs> we were in the last last man stands um, oh, awesome. in, in Hamilton, and we do it on Monday nights, and and we actually ended up winning the our, um, the social comp in in, uh, oh, in Hamilton. So that, that that's right up there. But I can't as much as I love that. It was so much fun. Um, I can't go past the hole of mine that I hit yeah. uh, at TV. Um, it's like this mythical years. moment. Can you talk me through it? Yeah. I've heard it secondhand so many times, but I want to hear it from. I've even been on the whole, you did it on. There's like, there's not a plaque, but there almost is. Like, everyone's yeah. got to talk about it. It's massive. I'm, I'm disappointed that there isn't like, even maybe a, um, <laughs> I was thinking like a, a bench, a bench seat, you know, yeah. like a Brad Memorial, even though I'm not, I'm not dead. Yeah. It's a Brad a Memorial. A pre Memorial or something. Yeah. yeah pre yeah. Memorial sort of set up. Yeah. Um, maybe I might have to actually pay for it. Maybe that's why it's well. not there. Maybe. <laughs> But yeah, basically it's the fifteenth at, at Tiki. The course hadn't been open long. Um, I think I might have been the first hole of mine at the at the new course in, in Hamilton. We'll claim it. About hundred and fifty meter par three, downwind, hit my eight iron. Just trying to draw this one in there, but I kind of just hit it outright. And there's this little hill at the front of the green, little little mound. Flag was in the middle, hit the mound and then Pop, pop down and started rolling towards the flag. Bang! Popped straight in, oh. and I just lost oh. it, like that. Like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who was with was, you? Um, who who fizzed it up with you? Who was in your group? So, so I was with uh, Matt Matt Boyd, who was um, he was with on the board for the Chiefs, and he was on the board at Tiki. So uh, 
uh, him and uh, he's he's a little bit of an older guy with um a couple of his mates so none of none of the lads <laughs> none of the roosters great, but none of the lads yeah. so you know i'm like kind of jumping all, all over these guys giving it the chahoos uh <laughs> and, but you know not getting as much fizz back as <laughs> yeah. uh, if i was with like damo and anton and and and, and luke and those guys so um yeah I, and unfortunately no one it was in the off season so no one was really around hamilton <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I've, got, I've got to celebrate this. <laughs> yeah, so I totally. drove up to so I drove up to Auckland and um had a few beers on the vi- viaduct with a couple of my mates. I just rang as many people up as I could <laughs> to see. <if> you could. <laughs> Mate, how did what did you card that day? Like um you know what what was the the final score? Was it you know was it part of a sort of a best round ever or? <laughs> well, that's the thing is uh, I was on an absolute heater that day. <laughs> um, and I managed to card a three under 69. Oh, nice. that's good yeah. golf. That's great golf. Yeah. Yeah. This is by far, like, I've, I've been under par before, but um, but not quite like that. It was, and to have the whole of one thrown in there, it was, yeah, it what was a pretty day. special. What a day, mate. That's awesome. And is it, have you have you hit the links in Paris yet? Is like, has Bodie sort of reached out and hooked you up, or actually are you a bit rugby focused, mate? No, nah, not yet. It's too it's too bloody cold yeah, over here to, to <laughs> at the moment. Went out to so Stade Francais actually have a like a uh, it's about fifteen minutes away. They have like a it's almost like a recreation centre, I guess. Of course, it's got they do. Of course they do. And yeah. golf and stuff, but they've got golf um and we get free access with um it's a driving range, a nine hole golf course and stuff. So oh, wow. I've been out there and hit a few balls and definitely a bit rusty, but uh yeah, looking forward to Probably about what five months time when I can start playing <laughs> when it, the weather's uh, starts getting a bit bit better over here. So yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, mate. Just just a tiny bit too late to to see the Ryder Cup this time. But how good how good would that be? No, but, no, mate, la, la, actually, just while we're on the sporting stuff or the non rugby sporting stuff, how does it go playing the Black Clash? Like for those who don't know, you know, which is sort of team rugby versus team cricket, bit of a celebrity cricket game that's been going he- here in New Zealand for three or four years. I think you played the first one in in your hometown. In Napier, but it's it's funny when I want to ask you this because like when you talk to like uh, Damien or or some of those boys who've played in the New Zealand Golf Open, you know, Damo's like, God, I'm more nervous hitting a tee shot in the New Zealand Golf yeah. Open than I am trying to kick a winning goal kick for the Chiefs. Like, what is it like for yourself, who's you know a, you know, a, a strong cricketer in his day, Weeby, um, but going out there and and facing former internationals. Um, with a bit of a crowd, this is not Monday night in Hamilton. Uh, you know, like there's, no. it's on the TV. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Like how how did that? I'm sure it's a huge amount of fun, but also oh. probably quite nerve wracking. Oh, I've never felt nerves like I have <laughs> when I was walking out to the middle, um, about to face. I think the first time I faced Jacob Oram and oh. um, then Dan Tory, who is just a genuine wizard. Yeah, I genuinely think he was in my head and knew exactly what I was going to try and then just threw the ball that was that would would stuff me up so yeah I, I, my I had two innings and struggled in both of them to be honest and um yeah look I thought I was not not a bad cricketer but there's nothing quite like being out in the middle against uh former former te- which like makes me take my hat off to like Will Jordan and yeah. Rito and stuff yeah. we batted really well against them like I, I found it so difficult. I think I might have hit. I think I might have hit one boundary. Might have hit one six, and then I was out the next ball. So that's. But I struggled. Other than that, could hardly hit it. So. Oh mate, you, you'll. T- it was good fun, man. It's so much fun. Like such good concept, and um, and getting to meet like your cricketing heroes, right? Yeah, like totally. Uh, so many guys I used to grow up just idolising um, in the cricket sense. It's pretty cool to rub shoulders with them. Oh, mate, I'm sure you'll be back into it. You've got a few games under the belt for Set and Cricket Club these days, so you're making a comeback. Oh, yeah, and, and, yeah. Yeah. and it's, um, it's at the Mount this year, isn't it, which is where your parents live and stuff. So um, Jonathan Thurston, um, someone else was in there. Oh, Brian Lara, how good. Yeah, Brian oh, good. Lara. Oh, Lara, oh, my God. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Mate, like it's um, – you're almost probably um, – you know, R and V's best known attendee. Uh, <laughs> who knows, who who knows how many in a row you went to? But like, is this? Am I right in saying like this year because of uh, rugby commitments will be the first year in in many many years that you, that you haven't been? Maybe talk us a little bit about yes. what R and V is and and maybe the your your best R and V edition and why. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I've been eleven times to R and V. So <laughs> definitely a veteran on the bounce, like straight. I'll, no, they weren't straight. No, I had about three or four years in a row straight out of high school. 
had a bit of a hiatus <laughs> and then went maybe six or seven in a row after that and just loved it. I, I, because they cancelled the one I was it a couple of years ago, and because yes. I always wanted to do one in my thirties, that was my thing. I want to do one in my thirties, <laughs> so that one got cancelled. So I had to do the next. The of next course, year. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so um, uh, yeah, so eleven, <laughs> eleven times veteran. Just love it, mate. It's um, like I love, just love my music. Obviously, love, love, yeah. especially my you know my house and drum and bass. Especially, like I just love it. Um, that and certainly like. R and V is at the perfect time for for rugby players yeah. as well because especially if you're in All Black, you're in that Super Rugby middle of January and you're going if you're on the end of your tour, you're going all the way to yeah, December um, really November. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so you're going eleven months straight. So it's the one time where you can sort of have a few drinks and uh, with the with the lads and and with uh, your non rugby mates as well, yep. and not worry about oh she's what's my schedule like next week? What what training do I have? Uh, you know what game do I have next week? I've got to worry about this. Got to watch what are, you know. You can just let your hair down. And just just enjoy it. Just enjoy the moment. And um, what I love about R and V as well is like you know so many people who are all there for the same reason. All there for, uh, on such a good buzz. Or everyone's re- and everyone's really respectful. Like as, yep. as a I guess a relatively well known person in New Zealand, you obviously get asked for photos and stuff all the time. But everybody's just so nice and respectful it's uh, you know i just love it and then obviously got to know the the guys at rmv hamish and um and, and kyle over the years who are just who are just great lads and um just you know you know really enjoy i guess once you get to know them you just really want to support to support uh support your mates as well so love going along and, and enjoying it and uh mate, i've just had so many good times i think uh you asked me what my best one was i think it was 2019 was that was the best one we just <laughs> had a great crew great um it was after uh, after the world cup in 2019 so it was, it'd been a long year and um great crew hired out an awesome house and um yeah the, i just i, I felt <laughs> yeah. like I'm pacing 2019 that's why i keep going <laughs> <laughs> mate, no, i've got it i'm gonna miss yeah, i'm gonna miss this one i know i know mate but it's all, all good things are going to come to an end i'm sure you'll be back at some stage but there's you know talk about that love of drum and bass and like, am i right in saying like you've even you do a little bit yourself on the side dabble a little bit um might have even did you open for net sky is it true as like aunt neetle just throwing me a massive you know um <laughs> one to <laughs> make me look stupid or is that legit no, nah, that's that's legit. Um, yeah, I guess some I, I guess I've just always loved drum and bass, like um, probably since Chase and Status from way back in the day, like Blind Faith and stuff, like early Sub Focus, and then the drum and bass uh, culture in New Zealand's just really grown. Like we've got some awesome producers here as well, like I think like you know Shapeshifter as well, yeah. and then guys like um, the Lee Matthews boys of. Uh, who love rugby they've gotten in, you know i've been lucky enough to to meet guys like that and they're just great you know normal kiwi blokes that yeah. are just happen to be really good at, at ripping it up music. yeah yeah you know montel 2099 is a huge chiefs fan so it's it's pretty cool like meeting these guys that you go and watch at big festivals um uh and just you know how much good buggers they are but yeah i i, I didn't i was kind of forced into <laughs> dabbling at djing i was uh, I kind of did the stupid video for for the All Blacks uh, in quarantine where I was sort of pretending like I was learning, uh, <laughs> and then um, George FM hit me up to do a, a hot set live on air, so I kind of had to force myself to try to learn. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, l- l- was lucky enough to meet um, Next Guy and um, his his manager at the time was a, a Kiwi guy, Josh Smith, who had been in um, kind of had mutual friends through our, our university friends and um, in Dunners and. Um, so I think Anton might have mentioned that I, I'd, I'd picked it up. And anyway, a couple of weeks later, he rings me up and he's like, mate, we want you to open for the next guy at uh, Spark Arena in a couple of weeks' time. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> like, the amount of DJs in New Zealand that, you know, we've got so many other good ones, yeah. for one, <laughs> that have been doing it for years that would kill for this opportunity. And here I am, who have been doing it for like a month. And you seriously come to do a 45-minute set <laughs> at Spark Arena. And, How'd know, we go? So How'd it go, to, mate? Yeah, How'd it go? I had, had to say it. Had to do it. So um, <laughs> it was an awesome – it was just such a cool experience. Like, it was – like, I was never been so, so nervous, I don't think, than – um, being up there and people watching me spin spin the decks, but cool experience. And then 
even just like hanging out with uh, everyone afterwards at the um, backstage afterwards with like Netsky and all the other artists that had, that had played that night. Um, yeah, it's it, it was pretty special, mate. And uh, yeah, it's something that I like look back on one day and be like, that's like it's pretty cool that that, that I did that. Ah. Totally, mate. Totally, mate. It's it's awesome. I, I I love it. Like um, you know, no doubt the Dix will be out at uh, Stade Francais pretty soon, and and uh, you know, you'll be. <laughs> I've already been asking about it. Like, <laughs> people have already heard, and they're like, oh, when are the Dix coming over? I'm like, oh, don't worry, they they're getting sent over. They'll be here soon. So, yeah, you'll see me up in the gym at some point. I'd say, mate, uh, doing it. But... You're gonna finish your career by you know doing the tunes beforehand, running on and playing, and then jumping on afterwards and interviewing players. You know, like this is this is the future yeah. for you, like multi-talented. Mate, I know as well that you love basketball. I love basketball, and it's hissing at the moment. Um, you know, talk us a little bit to throw a question at you. You know, if if Brad Webber um, got his break, NBA contract, um, who's he playing for and what other four players are, are taking the court with him in his starting five? <laughs> well, I'm... Um... A huge Atlanta Hawks fan, which has been it's been tough, but been I, tough I love days. the Hawks. I'm going straight to straight to the Hawks. And are you asking me like for NBA players or for um like rugby players that would be with me on the, on the starting five? NBA players, I think. So you're you're legit. You've made it. You're sort of the the new version of Spud Webb. You know, like you're yeah. um you, you're breaking the grass glass ceiling, and you need four guys to take you to the to the title. Who are they? <laughs> We've incarnated, uh, reincarnated. <laughs> that's that. it, that's so I'm, it. Yeah, I'm obviously running the point. Yeah, totally. Clearly. Yeah, totally. Um, but I'd, I, th- I think Nikola Jokic would be so fun to play with. Oh, the way the style that he plays, that he just involves everyone. So, you know, I'm saying I'm running the point, but it's probably going to be him. And sure. then I'm just running around. Um, he'd be pretty fun to play with. Um, I'm building my super team here, so LeBron's, <laughs> LeBron's got to be in there. Just can't believe what he does at his age, and is still you know one of the best best ever. So how good would he be at rugby? Like how good would oh, he be at rugby? Imagine him running down Channel One off uh, a short wall off at twelve. See him He's in the plane this week, like running the floor at thirty eight, and just like no issue, like just still the most athletic person on the court. Unreal. This is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah it's freakish. So. Uh, you g- can't help but admire him, and I, th- I just, I just don't understand the hate either. Like, well, no, we'll, no. we'll really miss it uh, when it's gone. I think so. Just appreciate it while it's here. Um, and then the other ones would be, oh, that's a great. Quote. So that's my center and probably my power forward sorted. So shooting guard and small forward. Um, got to throw KD in there. Oh, unguardable. Durant. He'll be there at, at small forward. But geez, this is just like the best team ever. Mm-hmm. And then my shooting card, geez, that's a. I'd love. Um, oh, God. This, I really like uh, the young guy from um, the Thunder, Shy Guild. Oh, Gilders, he's, Alex, yeah, yeah, yeah. More of a point guard, but he can certainly um, play the second. Be him or Luka Doncic would be my, my, my shooting guard. So Very there good. you have it. There's. Plus me, I reckon. Even if I'm on there right now, I still think that thing could go to the title. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I'd like to see. That's a good side. That is a good side. I mean, you'd be scrappy, mate. You'd be scrappy. You'd work hard. You'd be a nuisance. I'd be a defensive specialist. Yeah, yeah. and then sit in the corner. <laughs> yeah, twenty assists, no points. Like just like yeah. running the cutter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Rajon Rondo. Mate, let's talk a bit of footy, and and we've talked about the tradition of halfbacks in, in the Weber family, which is is so cool. Um, before you growing up, were you, were you always going to be a halfback? Like, was that it? Like, no choice, whether it be through, you know, your stature or family lineage, you know, like, was that, did it have to be that way? I think it was always going to be destined that I'd be a, a halfback as much as I tried to fight it. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, my, family, my family aren't the the, the tallest uh, the tallest family rolling around, so I think I was always destined to be a halfback, but um, I, I certainly fought it and I was a was a fullback for for a long for a couple oh, of go. years and yep. in my first my first few fish fifteen days uh, at at Napier Men's Napier Boys, <laughs> um, we so I was yeah tried to sort of fight and I think that helped my rugby to be honest. So yeah, also like I joined the I was I had a bit of always had a bit of speed about me, which has been a bit of a point of difference. But you know, I joined um, the athletics team. I wasn't the fastest guy at the school, but I joined the athletics team to to do the sprint training and stuff, and that really helped me and. Um, you know, certainly my speed and around 
you know, if I was able to break into the open field, then you know, I could I could finish a few tries. So certainly playing fullback and and um, getting that sprint training done um, really helped my my rugby in the long run. It was always been my point of difference, been my speed. So are you um yeah. when you talk about that now, like whether you know, we always when we talk about speed, it always you know we're talking about Will Jordan and Reeks and and some of these guys, and and I'm sure at the Chiefs, people like Shooter and that uh, you know Sean Stevenson are, are, are right up there. Can you take those guys like if these are whether it's ten or forty meters or whatever, because because like you say, that's your point of difference is is you're rapid. Like it's you know you've been able to score some pretty impressive tries because of your speed. Um, can you can you take those boys? Is there a few friendly wages going on in preseason when you know it's time for testing? Maybe five or six years ago, <laughs> probably, probably dropped off a few hundredth of a second uh, now, and maybe over ten meters, I could I could uh, hold my own with one of those blokes. But it's it's always been the top end stuff that uh, that those guys um, eat me up in. So yeah, yeah if I, I could get them in the first bit, but then they'd always the lot. Yeah. That's the long limbs on those boys. Eh? It's, you know, my short yeah. little stumps. Just, yeah, yeah. They run. There's a lot of a lot of strides, but yeah. uh, they're not. Going, you're, busy. Going you're busy. Yeah, you're busy. Really, really. You're busy. You're busy. You're busy. Hey, mate, you're a halfback. It only needs to be the first twenty or so, and and then and then you distribute, don't you, and put the boys away. Um, I want to talk a little bit about you know what took you down to Dunedin. You know, literally, um, you know, student centre of New Zealand. Um, you know, a place where. Um, you know, boys become men, I suppose, a little bit. But um, what dragged you down there? Was it the rugby? Was it just looking for, um, you know, a good post high school experience? What got you down south? No, it was it definitely wasn't rugby. I mean, um, I was I was good at high school, but I wasn't uh, a superstar or anything, so it didn't have any big offers uh, anywhere. I just wanted me and my best mate Gareth Evans and a, a couple other um, lads from from Napier Boys, which. Thought Dunedin looked pretty cool with the uh, <laughs> culture, the student culture down there. It was, it was as far away from from home as we could get, really. Far um, away from so, grad, granddad's critical analysis as you could exactly. get for a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So um, yeah, we all, I was, we were pretty excited just to, and we were looking to go to uni. So that was that was the, the place for us. I guess I'm a bit of a dying breed around. Um, you know, I was able to do four years at, at uni and then and then become a professional rugby player. There's not as as many of those guys rolling around uh, anymore, but really just stuck, like just had so much fun down there, mate. Is uh, um, the amount of people that that you meet. Um, you know, now when I play around the world or certainly around uh, around New Zealand, I've always got people to catch up with and have a real good balance. Now I think, um, uh, well, certainly going into professional rugby was really grateful for. Yeah. Of my life as a professional rugby player because I'd been a, a poor struggling student and <laughs> yeah. um, had to work pretty hard to to try and to try and get there and was able to live live life a little bit um, and just just enjoy what student life is about you know making twenty dollars last year the whole week <laughs> uh, making it make it go a fair way and um, you know I played Colts rugby first year out of school I didn't even play oh, yeah. prems my first year so played Colts and then played prems and. Then made the NPC and um, a few bumps along the road, but then eventually made Super Rugby, and so you know went literally uh, right the way through. Um, and mate, I you know I've obviously gotten close with guys like like Damien and Anton and, and Shooter and Luke Jacobson and those guys, but kind of feel feel a little bit sorry for them that they didn't get weren't able to experience um, what I got to experience because it was just so so much fun, and I'd recommend. Do they need to anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, there's, um, yeah, it's the mafia, anyone who's been to Dunedin, it's a pretty tight group. Um, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what age people are, there's something that sort of bonds them together in the place. But was it, was it Dunedin Sharks? It, like, when did the transition happen between, like you say, you know, someone who's uh, doing a degree, um, having a bit of fun, when did it change? Like, actually, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm decent at rugby and, and I'm starting to get asked and looked at for, um, teams that might pay me a bit more than 20 bucks a week and and that sort of stuff like when did that transition happen it was probably after i made the new zealand under 20s oh, yeah. um in 2011 yeah um like i said i had i didn't even made new zealand schools or anything like that um and i think that was yeah just when i started i guess maturing a little bit more and getting a little bit better and um it was in that 2011 under 20s team that was that was pretty awesome we won the world champs and um, stacked that, wasn't it absolutely stacked. stacked didn't it have 13 all blacks or people players who went on to be all blacks or something like that including brad weaver 
Yeah, yeah, including including Brad Weber. He's he's one of the, yeah, something like it might have been 13, um, at least 13 all blacks and maybe even four maybe international players as well, because there's like Brad Shields, Gareth Anscombe. Oh wow. Uh, Mefuna, um guys like that that, that didn't play. Um, and it was Bodie and Brody and that sort of crew, wasn't it? Brody, Brody, Sam Kane, uh, TJ. Yeah. Charles Piertel, Charles Piertel, like just holy heck. Look, looking back at that team, it's like, wow, what a freakish team. Well, we nearly lost to, to yeah. England in the final. They actually played probably better than us. We just had a couple of good moments, and they had guys like Owen Farrell and George Ford and um, uh, one of the Vinnie Polar brothers. So they're they're a pretty stacked team as well. So it's geez, that's so, a that's a hell of a final. You don't also. understand that's it also... at the time, mate. You, <laughs> yeah, you think like, oh, like it's just the. But then now, when you look back at it, it's just like, wow, that was a seriously freakish team so yeah it was it was basically after that that um i guess i started realizing that hey maybe maybe i am good enough to to play professional rugby maybe i maybe i could could make it so that's probably where the dream started yeah mate and it's sort of fast forward a little bit but i um you know i'd love to ask you um the links you went to to put on weight and and various things like that because <laughs> <laughs> but um but actually it was there's always sort of you know, when you talk to players, there's forks in the road and sliding doors and all that good stuff. But but almost, mm. you know, one of those sliding door moments for you or, or forks in the road was when you were dropped from the Otago team, I think. You know, yeah. like, talk us through a little bit around um, around that moment and then, you know, what you took out of it and what you did in the post to sort of, um, you know, perhaps um, kick on. Yeah, so uh, it was 2013, I think, Um and uh, Tony Brown was the head coach of, of, of Otago at the time. And um, I think, and yeah, he brought me in and said that, uh, you know, he's, they're dropping me from the, the, the Otago squad that I wasn't going to be in the, in the squad that year. And he sort of laid out his reasons why was that a lot of it was um, that he basically didn't really see me work on my game outside of, outside of the the training st- that was um was prescribed by the trainers and coaches and you know I wasn't getting significantly better um because of that and like look looking back obviously I was devastated at the time but um I think at the time I was really naive and thinking that just through maybe getting older and just by doing the training that the trainers and the and the coaches uh, have prescribed to you that that's going to be enough to um, to get better um, but it, it wasn't and and I'm really really grateful for for Brownie for doing that and making me realize that and I remember thinking from that moment on that there's that I'll never allow a coach to say that you know Brad Weber doesn't work hard for uh, you know it doesn't work hard at his game and so like it, it was a huge moment for me and 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 the kick up the ass that I needed because I wasn't the most I'm not the most talented guy like I you know, like I said, I was never a, a gun at school. Um, so I actually, to get the, I have to squeeze every bit of talent out <laughs> of me by actually working for it. And and Brownie made me realise that. And um, so when I got, when I was lucky enough to get another shot, um, you know, from that moment on, I worked my ass off to to be a better rugby player and and um, work on my on my game. And so when I got an opportunity um, a few months later with Waikato halfway through the season. I just remember thinking, I'm not going to let this chance go. And um, because of the work I'd done since that moment that Brownie had dropped me to the point where I uh, got an opportunity with Waikato, I, I had a couple of the, you know, I, had, I finished the seat. I was uh, the, one of the best few games that I've, that I've had with Waikato. I think it was like two weeks in, I had a real good game against Auckland. And then Dave Rennie was around at my house the next day, offering me a Chiefs contract. <laughs> um so within two weeks, I'd gone from like playing Otago Development, the, the like the B team, to getting a, a, a Super Rugby contract with the Chiefs, and probably because of the kick up the ass that I got. So I, you know, I wish I didn't have to have needed that, and I was lucky I got another opportunity. Um, but yeah, like, like really tried to turn that disappointment into um, into a positive, and I'm I guess I'm and yeah, then the rest is history, like they say. Um, but I guess from that moment on. Even through my Chiefs career and, and All Blacks career, I've I've tried to work work my butt off to um, make the most of any opportunities that I've got. Mate, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? In the space of two weeks, you go from being dropped, um, you know, for Otago to getting a, a Chiefs contract. In the space of two years, you're an All Black, which we'll talk about, which is yeah. which is pretty amazing yeah. and, and shows. I mean, firstly, too, there must have been, um, 
you know, like you say, when you're growing up, there's a lot of halfbacks who are big and strong. There's sort of there's always the chat around the halfback being the fourth flanker and all that sort of stuff. But then it was, you know, players like yourself and Nuggy who, um, you know, started, you know, showing that there's a bit of hope for the little man. Like, was it sort of Nuggy who started pioneering that for you? Like when you started seeing people who could, um, you know, similar size to you, but there was the game was changing and there was room for a guy who was, you know, really fit, really fast, like distribute really, really well. Like, must have given you a lot of hope because there was starting to be quite a good group of of smaller faster halfbacks wasn't there yeah absolutely mate i like i i owe um i owe aaron a lot um for his trailblazer <laughs> <laughs> um because you know i had a couple of professional coaches say that i'm probably too small to to be a professional halfback wow. and at the time they were probably right because of um the, the way that the halfbacks were back then and then nuggy comes along and, and really changes the game changes the way the all blacks play and um, so when I got brought up into uh, the Chiefs in 2013, 2014, you know, I was there as a point of difference because yep. um, Tawera Kerbalo and, and Augustine Pulu were the two, uh, yeah. two nines there. Tawera, probably still one of the best defensive nines that we've ever seen. And then Augustine, obviously, a, a, just a power, powerful runner. Um, and then I was there as this uh, complete different uh, small <laughs> pass guy, you know, t- to those other guys. So I was literally there as something a bit different. And um, and then through Tawita's injury the year later, I got, I got an opportunity to play a little bit more with with Augustine and um, managed to show that you know uh, my style of play goes goes pretty good, much much like Aaron's. And yeah, I guess us too. Then I'm not sure if there's uh, many other smaller nines going around there, but hopefully we uh, inspired a few uh, smaller smaller guys, smaller kids that, um, you know, you don't have to be a, a big brute to, to be an All Black. It's, um, and I'm very, very, you know, I'm very proud of, of that fact that I've been able to be my size and, and still kick it with the big boys. Ah, oh, mate, it's been awesome. And yep, you know, rugby is a power game, but there's there's players like yourself, Nuggy, Damien, that we mentioned earlier, you know, like there's still room for a, you know, a, a small, skillful, fast, brave person, which is which is exactly what you guys are, mate. You sort of, you know, in, in rugby careers, you know, I've heard people say a lot. You need you need a, some good management, and like you say, you work really hard once you'd had a bit of a bit of a punch to the nose. But also, you need a bit of good luck, don't you? And when you went to to the Waikato and the Chiefs, it seems like you you found your place a little bit, and you found your people in the sense that you know we look at them now and we think you know. Um, sort of really almost legends of the Chiefs jersey, but guys like Damo, Shooter, Anton Leonard-Brown, they were sort of the crew that you came in with, and it was a younger group. It was, you know, a bunch of guys who were just learning, but it seems like not only um, did you guys gel and you were able to play some really good footy, but but you're all good mates as well, which seems to have gone a long way. Like, you know, I want to talk to that a little bit. Like, the Chiefs and, and Waikato is a, a pretty special place for you, isn't it? You know, we joke about the Tron, but it's they're good days. They are, mate. Um, and you know, when I told people that I was moving to Hamilton when I was <laughs> uh, when I was in Dunedin, I had a few strange looks. But I've, mate, I, I couldn't speak more highly of the place. It's a, it's a it's a great spot to be. I I've just I loved my ten years there. Um, and yeah, like we were, yeah. You mentioned all those guys, and we sort of all come through together. And um, but we were very lucky that we were tutored by some some pretty um, pretty impressive humans. It, it, yeah. At the Chiefs, so I, mean, I remember. I know we were talking about Otago before, but like the sort of style of play down there didn't really suit um, yeah. suit the way that I played. So it was it was understandable that I was that I was let go. And but as soon as I turned up to Waikato and, and the Chiefs, you could just tell that that was like that was that was home for me. Like you just I just kind of got that feeling straight away, and certainly helped from the from the get go. Um, all the senior guys were just so well. Like I was thinking when I first turned up to the Chiefs, I was like, I'm not going to say <laughs> anything to anyone. <laughs> I just said, like, head down and just work, work. my work off and, you know, earn my respect. But they were so encouraging to to, to be yourself right from the get-go. Um, I remember thinking like Liam Messam and Cruds and stuff, like I'm just not going to say anything to those guys, but they were just so welcoming from the get-go. So that was that was really cool for, for me, like, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, well, okay, I can, I, this feels a little bit like me. And then even little things like my first catch up with um, the coaches, like Dave Rennie, Wayne Smith, and and the trainers and stuff. Never were they like, oh, we want you to get bigger, um, this and that. They all they talked about was my strengths and like what, how my strengths yeah. 
could help the Chiefs and where they saw me fitting in and how it's going to work. And I just sort of sat back thinking like, man, most of the coaching catch-ups I've had, been like, what, what, what are you going to work on? And what are you going to What I can't do. All they wanted to do about, yeah, what you can't do. All they wanted to do was talk about my strengths. And I so I, from that moment, I was just like, yeah, this is this is it for me. This is home for me. And um, never looked back really. And, and you know, I, that was obviously my experience. And then no doubt it was the same for those young guys, Damo, Anton, and, and Shooter coming through as – they came through as 18 year olds and um, I was there as a wily 23 year old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So no doubt that um, it's it certainly helped those boys and you've seen the players that they've, they've, they've become as well. It's, it's through, I just think the, the environment and even now, now that, um, you know, now that we're sort of senior guys, I certainly like to think that I try and um, yeah. encourage that same sort of uh, culture that was left to me by guys like Liam Messam and Aaron Cruden and guys like that. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty special place, mate. Mate, it's awesome, and you, you touched on a couple of those guys, but I mean, without getting into the to the details of it, I think Australia have missed a trick with Rens, haven't they? Like he he's a he is a a great coach. You had Smithy there alongside him, and you know maybe chat a little bit more about that. Like those, I've just heard nothing but good things around the way those guys operate, the way array, the round they created an identity at the Chiefs and and sort of built it from the ground up, um, and did it in a way where. It then empowered the players like yourself to carry it on. No matter who's there now, um, there's a way um, and a, a particular culture and environment that's at the Chiefs that you feel a responsibility to carry on and, and no doubt you've flicked it onto someone, um, whether it be Damo, Anton, those sort of, I mean, they're, they're good men, aren't they, Renz and Smithy? Oh, big time, man. I can't believe... I couldn't believe what Rugby Australia did to Dave Rennie. Like, yeah. he's just the perfect guy for... He's the man for the job, wasn't he? He's the man for the job to getting a, a a union that's struggling, getting them on the right track and instilling good um, values and things like that. And like, the thing that I loved about guys like Renz the most, like he is one of the most hardworking coaches, you know, that I've ever come across, like his, his detail and uh, around game plans and, and training and, and things that he sees that like, oh, it's just like galaxy brain stuff. Like I couldn't even, <laughs> I couldn't see that at all, you know, like, yeah. whereas he's, he's just saying it because of the time and effort that he puts in. But then also like, because of, you know, he kind of gets you, uh, you know, playing for a purpose that's greater than yourself as well. And like when you're playing for a guy like that and playing for a team like that, like you, you can find an extra five to ten percent of yeah. you know in, in a tough situation or when you when you're absolutely gassed it's it's things like that that i've instilled through through culture that allows you to be better than you actually think that your brain's telling you you can actually go a long a little bit harder and um i've just always admired always admired um wrens for that and you know now i'm um seeing it a lot with clayton mcmillan as well so um, yeah, he's he's really good at, at stuff like that too. So um, the Chiefs are in good hands for a few years. So I'm pretty excited to hopefully see them go one better next year. Mate, we're going to talk about that stuff, but it is the intangibles, isn't it? Like some of these, the Crusaders, the Chiefs, the Hurricanes, the Blue. You know, like some of these teams are pretty tight, pretty close to each other. Like the games can be pretty tight. There's, you know, it's it is that those tiny little intangibles sometimes that get you over the line. And there there have been times in, in Chiefs history where they've they've got those stars to align and it's meant they've, they've won some titles and won some big games. So, and I'm sure that's down to, to those men. I want to pick a couple of moments out from your domestic career before we talk a little bit about the All Blacks. Good days in the Jersey, Webby. And like surely, um, you know, that young group of players that we talked about for the Waikato versus your home province, the Hawks Bay, ran Philly Shield match. Um, last game of the season, I understand. Like talk, talk us through that week in that game. Like is, is that maybe your best day in in a p you know in a domestic jersey it was um it certainly sounds like it mate yeah yeah it's mate it's definitely there's nothing quite like your first ranfully shield win like um and the whole thing around that week as well we we were pretty average that up until that point um hawks bay were just littered with um super rugby stars they would they'd been phenomenal all year so no one really gave us a chance. Even I remember even one of our assistant coaches, we were previewing them and he was just going on and on about how good they are and how good they are. And we were kind of looking around each other like, does he know we're playing these guys this week? Like, he maybe pump our tyres up a little bit too. Um, but, and like, you look back on that team and like, it's got star power, our, our team, I mean, on the Waikato team in 2015, it was like Damian McKenzie, Anton Leonard-Brown, Sean Stevenson, 
um, and myself, and then like a few a few other guys. And but those guys were eighteen. Those were like first yeah. or second year out of school, eighteen, nineteen. So they're not the stars that we know today. And um, I remember we had like a kind of almost like a crisis meeting um, <laughs> in the lead up because like boys are just unhappy with, with how we're playing. And um, we kind of decided, like, all right, we don't want to be slaves to the the game plan this week. Like, we've got nothing to lose. Let's give it a red hot crack. And I remember Josh Honnick, the tight head prof, um, <laughs> put his hand up and he's like, "So you're telling me <laughs> that I can stand at first receiver if I want to?" And because I was the one kind of facilitator, I was like, "Yep, that's what we're saying." And so he's like, "Okay." And fair play to him, he did it. Against, he did it in the game against Hawks Bay. Dummy stepped through and and scored a and try scored from the prop. It is out, so it's just like ah, fair play. <laughs> yeah. So like when when stuff like that's happening, you kind of just like, well, may, maybe it's our day. And um, I, yeah, the thing I remember about that sort of so dad, they Hooks Bay, they do it really well. They have a um a lunch with all the sponsor or the dinner with all the sponsors before the game. They have a guest speaker and yeah, um, my old man was the guest speaker that night. Oh, how good. Uh, I was, I was I was obviously um captaining Waikato that night against uh, uh for the shield and so the, I think that one of them asked them like you know who are you who are you supporting tonight? What do you hope to have? And so he said, Look, I hope I hope Brad plays well, but I want Hawks Bay to win. Yeah. And uh then I go out and score a hat trick in the second <laughs> half. <laughs> and, and uh and win the shield off him so i think and he was bawling his eyes out of the, of the thing i don't know if he was like sad or sad or happy but yeah <laughs> uh, but it was just mate underdogs you know just the yeah. games you're not meant to win are the ones that feel the best and you don't you remember your your first shield win as well and beaver had just come back from, oh, um, from the legend doing us as well this is like the where the thing that our relationship with beaver really uh began <laughs> and this is where probably grins began actually <laughs> yeah. um but we had uh he'd just come back from japan the movie had just come out the kick oh, had just come out. peak this beaver celebrity. peak beaver time yeah peak beaver and so um and we had a big the sunday um we call it black sunday run at, at, at beaver's place um all of us around there uh having a few beers with the ramfley shield it's just oh, it's something special it's a beautiful thing and isn't that though um isn't that a funny thing around you know you can you can plan till the cows come home you can like try and cover every detail of rugby sometimes and that's what we do sometimes in professional rugby and and try and be so prescripted and how we're going to go out and play the game but actually for that week you're like actually let's just rip the band-aid off boys have a go play what's in front of us you know use your skills and a little bit of magic and you tried to do it the following week it probably wouldn't happen but it just was <laughs> <laughs> the stars aligned and, right. and um you took the shield and and then what actually uh, the next season you were playing for the hawks bay yes yeah i'd already <laughs> signed i'd already signed for hawks bay as well so i already knew going into the game that i was going to to hawks bay that year but um and Literally every single promo, any school visit, anything <laughs> that I went to for the next, uh, well, up until this year, someone would always ask, why did you take the shield off us when you were coming at us? So I always say I would have, I'd do it 10 times over. It was totally <laughs> um, it was the best week of my life after that. And then so I was so, so grateful. I was so glad that I could finally put that demon to bed yep. and uh, win the shield back um, for Hawks Bay. Um, you know, it might be in two pieces at the moment, but you know, it's yeah. getting repaired. It'll be back out to the community soon. It'll so be ready for next season. Time. It'll be ready. Yeah, mate. How good. Now, I want to, um, you know, a couple of things. One, put it to you, sort of um, best day in the Chiefs jersey. I haven't picked one myself. Um, and then I wanted to talk about your final game. But firstly, mate, um, you know, best, you know, best day or, or period in the in the in the Chiefs jersey, like you've talked about, it's a club that's really special to you. you basically, your best mates um, are your teammates there. Um, is there any moments that really stick out as as um, peak Chiefs for, for Brad Weber? There's like, yeah, oh, mate, there's so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I love the South Africa trips. They were always fun, so I'm gutted that they're not around anymore. But uh, the one that probably sticks out the most is uh, our win against Wales. Oh, here we go. Um, in 20, was it 2016? Yeah, we, we were fortunate enough we got to play against Wales because um, Gats was Warren oh, Gatlin's yes, coach. Yes, yes. So we played them played them on a midweek uh, on a midweek night, I think, and um packed out uh FMG Stadium uh and we smoked them. We absolutely <laughs> destroyed them. Um 
I think it was like 38 7 or something like that. Beaver, Beaver captain side, like we obviously didn't have our all blacks. Um, and I was I was playing nine and and feeding Beaver the ball was pretty cool. And um, I think I scored a try that night, so it's pretty special. Yeah, that that's that's one that probably sticks out the most. Something a bit different. Um, I like that. I like that. Um, I want to ask you about um the last game, you know, the the final against Crusaders. Like we talk about the good stuff a lot, but that one had to sting, eh? Because you're you're such a proud um Chiefs man. Um, you know, you probably were aware that it was your last or one of your last sort of games and, and no doubt put a lot of energy into it. And it was just genuinely one of those games where it could have gone any way. Like like a lot of the games are between, you know, top teams at the end of the season and, and you know, the 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 story will say that the Crusaders were able to get the win, but um I suppose it's double edged, hugely proud of the team, but also like it had to sting, mate. Like um, I felt for you and the boys um, watching that because it was a brutal game. Oh, mate, that's yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever. Sorry, get mate. To sorry, me. sorry. Um, to bring it's up, all good. It's all good. You know, um, it's just. Well, I guess it's like, wow. Well, we were, you know, probably the best were the best team in in the comp right up until yeah, you're until hissing. that night. Um, you know, we really believed in our game plan. Really believed in what what we were, the way we were playing. We thought we were playing some great rugby with uh, some pretty awesome awesome players running the cutter. And um, uh, you know, I'd like to think that you know maybe nine times out of ten we win that game, and then um, we just got the Crusaders on that uh, on the night when when they beat us. But fair play to them. Like I've got nothing but respect for for the Crusaders and the way that they're able to grind us down and 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 do whatever it took to to win like you just got to tip your hat to them it's you just think you know <laughs> i've had seven in a row like give just just give me one yeah just just one <laughs> just give me one <laughs> i'm out you guys have had all years just just one just give me one to but, finish uh, with yeah yeah exactly but you know i suppose but also we, we didn't help ourselves as well like uh three yellow cards and yeah. anton's was probably not to be a red so um, you know, you're probably never going to beat the Crusaders when when you're playing with with 14 for that for that amount of time. But um, yeah, so it's something that yeah I'll struggle with, and then <laughs> and then I obviously lost the MPC final as well. The, boy, the, 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 the boys lost the World Cup final. So <laughs> if you're a Chiefs and All Blacks supporter, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year. <laughs> it's time for a reset. But mate, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. I mean, it shows, doesn't it? Like. It's such a fine line. You absolutely have to rip in these days in rugby. You have to be physical, but then, like you say, um, you know, if you just get it ever so slightly wrong, you're going to be a man down, and that makes a massive difference in those tough games. But I mean, you know, it's um, you know, it's it's character building, isn't it? And the um, I'm sure um, the boys, it's it's a good side again this year. Just looking at the squads for um, mm. the year ahead, there's again, there's there's some really exciting. God, like that that backline is is looks lethal, and then there's. Some of those young forwards uh, are really promising. So uh, excited to see what comes out. Mate, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your all-black career. Like, firstly, you know, talk about the first time you were named in the team. Like, you know, wh- what did that look like? Was it on your radar? Like, was there whispers, you know, that Brad Weber might get the call up? And, you know, uh, was it read it on the tally? Sky, the breakdown? Did you get a phone call? You know, it seems to be a little bit different for every person that I ask that question to on this podcast. Yeah, so the first time I made it, it was uh, 2015. Um, but I, so I'd, I'd had a really good year. It was my first full year where I was getting starts with the Chiefs and um, played really well. And there was whispers that, you know, maybe I could be a bolter because um, Tawita was injured at the time. Yeah. Um, obviously, TJ and, and Aaron were the incumbents as well. Um, but I, I thought in a World Cup year, maybe it's not really, like, you know, maybe that's probably a bit of a risk taking a, a, a rookie halfback. Um uh, and subsequently, Tawita was named in in, in the side. Um, so I was, I think we'd finished our season. So I was having a few beers somewhere, I think. And then um, I think Darren Shan, the manager, rang me up, and um, he could tell that I, we were somewhere. He said, "Oh, you better put the, you might want to put the beers down because um, we need you coming to camp tomorrow <laughs> or like the next day or something." And um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, because we we want you to um, come Samoa for the the first test there, and I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I went and told the boys and sat and um, had and another day night out. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> celebrated a little bit longer, and then, and then knocked it on the head. And um, so yeah, I went went to um, so I got brought in for for a couple of weeks with with the All Blacks, and then um, and then yeah, Fozzie um, brought me into oh like side room and one of the meeting rooms at 
the hotel and said, "Oh, you're gonna you're gonna play against Samoa next week," and I was just like, "Whoa, what?" Whoa. Couldn't, yeah, it kind of took me, but I wasn't expecting it. Really could, and yeah, so <laughs> I was like, so I rang my rang my parents and um, told all them, and um, yeah, I was pretty stoked. And like at this point, it was pretty much. I remember like you, your first All Blacks um, camp, you get up in front of the team and just sort of say who you are really introduce yourself and like what your rugby journey is and i sort of got up and said look it was literally two years to the day <laughs> that i got dropped from otago <laughs> from the Otago NBC team. so to be here right now is just it's just been a, a huge like it's just massive like never never would have thought it would it would happen so um yeah it was a pretty crazy turnaround um Mate, yeah, how good? Like, how good? Now, two years doing that, it's, it's pretty crazy, man. So, so is that two just... two fifteen? Like you sort of got McCaw and Carter floating around, and a, you know, Rito and some some pretty big dogs, you know, like yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And and did you get on? Like, did you play against some? Uh, what was that like? Like, was it? You know, can you remember? Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, I remember. It was, I remember it was so hot. It was we were, <laughs> it was like May or June in New Zealand. So right, it's like middle of winter, and then going over there, it's like thirty two degrees. Crowd full of crazy Samoans just <laughs> screaming at us. Um, and I come on for about the last like 15, 20 minutes. Um, we just held on to win. It was pretty close in the end. Yeah, I remember um, it being quite hectic, okay, eh? Pretty close. And yeah. and uh, they were sort of thinking, shit, we might be a chance here. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what exactly what happened. So uh, just grateful that we did that. I wasn't part of the first team to to lose to Samoa or something. But um, that was pretty cool. Like I remember I roamed with um, Dan Carter for my the, the oh, first awesome. week. And, like this is this is crazy because <laughs> <laughs> dc's a lad but it, but like were you walking on eggshells and sort of wondering what to to talk to the big man about because you know as you know now he's he's just a cruisy laid-back kiwi but probably at the time yeah. you know like you're thinking oh christ it's, you know it's dan carter he's he's one of the big boys yeah i was thinking i uh, again i might not say too much but like <laughs> Much like those guys I was talking about earlier, he's pretty pretty easy going. Eh, DC, he's, yeah. he's pretty easy to get along with a, a good man. So, um, yeah, no, nah, he's he's good. I remember he, I remember something real small, but he like gave me like one of his um, Adidas jerseys that he had, and I was like, oh yeah, well, that's pretty that's that's pretty cool. Got one of DC's jerseys. <laughs> he doesn't mind a bit of drum and bass as well. Did you talk a bit of drum and bass, or you know, you take the decks over, or was that too early doors for that sort of carry on? Yeah, it was too. Early. I think um, decks were probably played on vinyl back then, and yes, I wasn't re- yes. didn't really have my didn't really have my head around uh, vinyl back then. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I remember um, talking to him about it maybe a year or so ago, and him say <laughs> he dabbled in it a little bit as well. But he reckons he could only do like he's got two songs that he just like <laughs> trans between the whole time. Like so that's all he can do. So, yeah, <laughs> ah, classic. Um, mate, fast forward a little bit to 2017. Um, like you were hissing, like you had played really, really well in the preseason, super fit. Um, like you say, mm-hmm. you had, you had developed those routines where you're just working really hard, went over to the tens, um, for the chiefs and, and yeah, got a bit of an uppercut. Talk us through that one. Cause it's, it's actually, it's a hell of a story. Um, uh, you know, that, yeah, that injury. Uh, yeah. yeah. So playing in the um in the final against the, the Crusaders and the Brisbane Tens and um for, I actually haven't watched yeah. uh haven't rewatched it. I know it's out there somewhere, but from what I remember is I was standing in a tackle, someone held my like sort of down my lower leg and I was looking to try and offload or pass, and then I just got hit uh on my uh, like blindsided on my leg. And my and at this point my femur just fully snaps. And it's sound apparently it sounded like a shotgun going off. And that just never and, happens. I don't think I've ever heard of that yeah, happening in rugby nah, ever. No, nah, never. And and in fairness, at the time, uh, so I just went pretty much straight into shock straight away. I was like, I uh, don't remember any any pain whatsoever. Um, oh, actually, the funny part about that is Jack Goodhue. Yeah. come up to me in 2019 or my in the All Blacks camp and was like oh I suppose I should say sorry to you and I was like what do you mean he's like oh I'm the one that actually um I'm the one that broke your leg at the tens and I was, <laughs> so he'd been holding on I had no idea but it was it was Jack Goodhue two years um, later who, a few years later he's the one that broke my leg um but anyway so I'm on the ground I'm not feeling anything like I'm feeling like a sensation down my left side like I don't I don't feel any pain and they the doctors come running out 
And um, at this time, I'm like looking down and my ankle was like, like that. It's kind of like twisted. So obviously, like now I know now, like because the bone's gone, it's like the foot just kind of uh. just rotates. But I'm like, oh, there's no, but there's no pain. So I haven't dislocated my ankle because it, it's definitely not down there. It's more sort of around my thigh or knee. So I say to them, I'm like, I think I've done my knee. I think I've done my knee. And so uh. they're like, oh, okay. So they try and get get me up, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not getting up. So they put me on a stretcher, take me, take me into uh, the medical room. Now, at this point, the match day doctor's there and he's assessing me and they're, they're doing the test for the knee because I've said that's my knee. So they test for the medial and then to test for the ACL, you pull uh, your lower leg and because if you've done your ACL, your leg yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yep. away. And at this point, he's obviously, my femur's obviously not S- attached. So he's pulled my whole, my whole leg away. My whole um, femur's like starting to, and, I'm, and it's feeling real well. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no don't do that, don't do that. And so he goes, okay, I'm sorry, mate, but you've done your ACL <laughs> and your knee. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm like, oh, damn, so I'm devastated. <laughs> so obviously at this point, I still don't know that I've broken my leg. They ice my knee up, put me on a wheelchair, put me out and um, watch the rest of the final. And we end up winning up, stoked. But at the same time, Mitch Graham has snapped his tib, his tibula and his tibia and fibula. So he's like his leg is like that. So he's got the he's got the uh, ambulance to the uh, to the hospital. So there's no ambulance for me to jump in. So I have to jump in this little car of one of the doctors, and my leg just doesn't quite fit in. Like I put I go in butt first, and then swing around, and it doesn't quite like my. Funnily enough, my legs are just a little bit too long, which is the first time that's ever happened to me. <laughs> and um, so they have to push my leg up, and at this point, like the adrenaline's rock rock. Uh, worn off and i'm screaming in pain um as they're trying to move my leg to fit me into this car and i'm this poor nurse who's doing it and i'm screaming at her i'm on the green <laughs> i'm on the green whistle at this stage finally too. going to the um going to the hospital and uh get in the mri and at this point like my leg is throbbing my thigh is like it's so sore and so they come across the MRI uh, machine. They're like, "Oh, your knees, your knees structurally fine. It, no, there's nothing wrong with that." And so I'm like, "Just uh, check my, check my thigh now." They check it, and then they come in like two minutes later. They're like, "Holy shit, you've broken your femur. We're gonna get you into surgery like right now." And so like emerge like sh- pretty much straight in there, straight into it. Um, and now I obviously learn that I'm very very lucky because. The femur is right by the femoral artery. It could, if I'd, if I, if it split that, you know, you bleed out in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'm pretty sure they've given that doctor at um, Suncorp Stadium a fair bit of stick um, for pulling my femur away from itself. Uh, oh, yeah, my so, God. yeah, it's pretty crazy that, uh, looking back on it. Um, but yeah, it was looked after by some pretty good surgeons. I've still got the rod in there at the moment and. Uh, the titanium rod that's holding it all together. So uh, and I'm, 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 I'm good as gold now. <laughs> and, and am I right in saying that um, that you got back in, in six months or recovery time six months? Because like when I just, I hear that story, you know, I know how long it takes for an ACL and different sort of things. Um, and it's longer than six months. Like that's actually amazing. Like, did you come back, you know, just as fast and, and ready to go in six months, which seems phenomenal that you'd be playing rugby in the same year that you snapped your femur and, <laughs> and, yeah. you know we're giving a few nurses a spray at the start of the season yeah it's 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 pretty crazy but it's, it is also crazy how how good the human body can heal itself and yeah. i was actually lucky funnily enough lucky that i broke my femur and, and didn't do my acl because um bones have really good um healing uh properties uh, okay. so they yeah when it, when it, once it was back in place I was basically going to always going to be good. It was always going to, it comes back stronger. So it calcifies around the, around the break and literally comes back stronger. So um, it was never going to be any issues um, coming back from it. So I was always confident that, you know, they were like yeah, six months, you're going to be sweet. Uh, it, it probably took me another 18 months to start feeling like myself, to be honest, um, yeah. in terms of like fitness. So it probably took me a Makes two sense. full years before I actually felt um normal again like completely uh you know speed back fitness especially fitness was the biggest part um yeah that probably took two years 
Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Mate, yeah, man, an amazing chapter in the journey. And, and like, well, obviously, you know, that's a significant injury. Like, it was 2017, which is the Lions tour year. So, you know, unfortunately, you weren't able to be considered for selection for that. But fast forward to, to 2019, and it's another World Cup on our doorstep. I know it's something you worked phenomenally hard towards. Also, maybe even right in saying that there was potential overseas contracts on offer, but you, yeah. you know, I'm sure for you know for good money and better money that you're earning here in New Zealand, but you decided to put those on hold for for a bit and and um, and have a crack um, at the 2019 side, and you made it. Like, as in some regards, was making the 219 side better or, or different or more satisfying than being selected in. 2015 I mean talk us through that journey a little bit um that year yeah that yeah to firstly answer it like it was it definitely was more satisfying the 2019 year than the 2015 year I think because because I'd worked so damn hard to to get back and um I remember thinking 20 like at the start of 2019 like this is probably going to be my last genuine crack at it so I think up until that point I'd I was so obsessed with making the All Blacks again that it kind of clouded a lot of my judgment, especially the back end of seasons um, in Super Rugby from like 2016 to to then. Yeah. And so I was like, you know what? Like, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever. I just want to work hard and see how good I can be this year. And if I make the All Blacks, then great. If I don't, then I'm probably going to go overseas. And do you think um, the result, like the trying to make the All Blacks, was almost affecting your performance? Is that what you're saying? Like, for a, right. you were so Absolutely. worried about it that you were. You were sort of not thinking about the process and were worried about the result, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, because at, at the start of the season and pre in seasons before 2019, I started really well. The first half of the year was I, I was, you know, one of Into the yeah. I was playing really well. And then in the second half of Super Rugby season is when the All Blacks selection things start coming into into play because you're getting you know, people are talking about you, talking about all black squads, like who's going to make it, who's not going to be in it, and you know that I start thinking, oh, geez, what are the what are the all black selectors need to see from me? And yeah. it just just absolutely clouded my my train of thought, and I would play terrible in the back end, and wow. and ultimately they wouldn't select me because of that. And fair enough too, like I was gutted at the time, but looking back, I'm like, well, I didn't force my way in. Um, and so yeah, 2019 was like a it was just like a I was like, you know, whatever happens, happens. Like, why don't I just enjoy this potential last year with the Chiefs that, um, and just have fun and yeah. see 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 what happens and work hard and see how good you can get. And funnily enough, I had the best, one of the best years of of uh, of rugby that I that I'd had. I was one of the better players in Super Rugby that year and um, managed to to make my way through and. Yeah, I had a significant offer from Japan. <laughs> even like, even like looking back on that, I'm like, oh, geez, maybe you should. Have done that. <laughs> especially when you start thinking of dollar terms, it's yeah. like, oh, um, oh but, a little, little, uh, little house on the Coromandel, little. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. But, um, but ultimately, I, I remember thinking, when it come down to it, whether I stay in New Zealand or and give the All Blacks a go or, or go, I was like, what, one day. You know, when I'm 40 in a pub with yep. with some mates, you know, what do I want to look back on and 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 be really, you know, and I guess just no have, have no regrets. And I just felt like if I went in at the peak of my powers, that I would have regretted that more than if I'd stayed and, and tried to tried to make the All Blacks and tried to um, forge a good New Zealand rugby career. So I'm I'm really stoked that I did that. And yeah, when I it was the first time that I'd actually been named in the squad, yeah, like right. when they named yep. the TV. So. To hear your name out for the first time like that, it was um, it was it was pretty satisfying. It was, it was uh, yeah, that was that was it made it all worth it, mate. Yeah, for that second time, like like mm -hmm. you say, um, you were genuinely called out in the naming of the All Black squad. Um, yeah. Were you nervous? Where were you? You know, it's it's Weber, so you're not you're not early doors. You got to wait. Um, you know, how does how does that play out um, second time round? Yeah, so I was. Um, obviously I, I didn't have a phone call or anything like that so I had no idea whether I was in or not and yeah like you say Weber's right at the end um I'm sitting at my house with um my two housemates um Abby and Bex um and we're listening and um I think Pitanara goes first then Smith and so the girls are suddenly looking they're like 
this is it when you're in and i'm like well they might only take two just you know? and then yeah, <laughs> they grad weber and then we're just screaming up screaming there yelling oh yeah it was just like one of those um euphoric moments that you'll just never forget and yeah then the phone blows up everyone's texting and, and calling it's pretty cool like uh yeah man that one that one just it, that hit home yeah that was good yeah Mate, so good, so good, and I and I'm sure. It's cool, it's cool. I think I think it's cool that they don't don't yeah. ring you as well. Yeah, like yeah, you yeah. just got to listen to it. Ah, oh, mate, it's it's you know for the for the average punter and fan like myself, it's not something you ever experience, but it's probably a pretty cool feeling. And then to be able to sort of leave the house and and give you know Anton and and those sort of guys a ring and say well done lads and and know that you're off to do something together is is just got to be so special. Um, mate, just you know that that was awesome and and then from there you're actually a bit more of a regular fixture um in the team it looked like you know particularly 21 you played a heap of rugby for the all blacks is same thing as with the chiefs is there a particular moment that sticks out in the jersey um after being named that was that was a good day at the office for brad weber oh that's a great question uh i think my first my first big start against australia and perth um in 2021 was like a, a moment because like I I had games off the bench. I think I might have started against Tonga, um, yeah. but hadn't started a big test. You know, haven't hadn't started one of the big ones. And we the All Blacks hadn't played well at, in Perth um, before, so there was a lot going into it. And it was my first big start against uh, one of the big nations, and played really well. I was really stoked with how it went, and had I think um, so that moment certainly if anything said to myself that like I belong here, you know, like yeah. the previous ones is kind of like, well, you're off the bench here and there and um, playing against sort of lo- uh, tier two teams. So like, are you really good enough for international rugby? Um, and so certainly 2021, that whole year really was, uh, uh, if anything, just said to myself, like, yeah, you're, you're, you're made for international rugby. And I think I started a game against um, South Africa as well. And, and played really well in that game too. So after that, it's like, yeah, okay. Like if I'm required to start big yep. tests against whoever, I, I I know I'm I'm confident through experience and through competence that that um, that I'm good enough to to be here. Um, yeah, which was really cool. But also, I guess um, after the next couple of years of not making it and still feeling like I still had a lot to give, it sort of made twenty two and twenty three. Um, tough, yeah. Mate, it was, like you said, it's so cool to get a taste because all the boys say, you know, it's it's not just about making the team, it's about, um, you know, representing the jersey well, which you absolutely did. Was Test Rugby like just, is it another, a complete another level up from playing high-level Super Rugby or is it more just around um, the pressure anticipation that goes with being, you know, an international rugby player? Like what's the difference there and, and you know, perhaps were you in a, a better position to handle that as just a more mature player in 221. You know, you had a little bit of, well, not a little bit, a lot of rugby experience under the belt by then compared to, to 215, you know, which was six or seven years earlier. I was so much more prepared for it. Yeah, like I knew that I didn't have to go in there and do anything special. Yeah, Like I just had to do, just be me, just do my job. I think in previous years I might have gone out to try and prove something and maybe try to push things a little bit when they're not on. And what I'd learned was that, for me, I, when especially in a team like the All Blacks, like I just need to do my job really well, just do my course skill sets really well, pass and kick really well, and then if opportunities come up to showcase my speed and showcase my um, my support play, then those things will happen. So long as I'm taking care of everything else, and you know, if if those opportunities don't arise, then so be it. As long as I've done my job, then I'll then I'll be happy, and um. And, and, and yeah, I guess that's the the benefit of of having been around for a while up until to that point that I was I did feel really ready and I you know I played a, a lot of Super Rugby and and st- played a lot of big games by that stage but I guess you the pressure knowing especially with the All Blacks knowing that everyone expects you to win um, is certainly heightened and uh, <laughs> Test Rugby there's not as much uh, there's you know if you're a little bit off or if if you think you can just cruise here and there get found out pretty quickly so you got to be on for for a long time but certainly felt like I was uh yeah I was made and ready for for international rugby by that stage it's an amazing thing isn't it like such a funny thing like you hear a lot of players say 
you know, oh, when I first made it, I tried to do too much. I wanted to impress and all that sort of stuff. And you totally think, oh, well, you know, if enough older players, you know, pass that information on to young guys, they won't do it. They'll just go out and do their job. But it's just a bit of human nature, isn't it? Sometimes it's just so. time on yeah. the grass. It's just time on the grass, like, before it, it sort of finally sets in and you become more comfortable in your own skin and, and around doing your job and, and being a part of the doing your job in the machine sort of thing, isn't it? Well, and, you, and I, I had learned from previous t- times, yeah. whether it be in Super Rugby or something, where I've tried to um, do things that weren't on or tried to, to push things when it, when it wasn't on. So, like, I'd already learned that lesson uh, myself. And like you say, like, so many people say, just do your job, just do your job. But <laughs> something, and especially as a young guy, you're just like, well, yeah, I'll do my job, but then yeah. I'm going to go and do something yeah. Unreal too, because that's but that's also me. watch this. <laughs> yeah, 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 hold my beer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mate. It's um, it's pretty cool, and I think something that we touched on a little bit at the start of the pod is like because you, you know, weren't necessarily a, a schoolboy superstar. Went down, did four years at uni, you know, played for the Sharks, the original fins up, which I think is important to get on the pod, isn't it? Is that it's yes. not the market. I'll let you tell that because I think it's an important rugby fact that anyone listening to this pod needs to know. Yeah, so the Dunedin Sharks are the originator of the Fins Up. Since 1872. Two, let's say two. Let's say two, yeah. So a long time ago. The point we're making is a long time. 150 years, of the over 150 years they've they've been around for. So we've been throwing up the Fin a long time, a much longer time than... uh, than the muckle, and I still hear people being like, "Why do you throw the muckle fin up?" I'm like, "Well, I don't. I don't. It's the sharks, mate. mate." But the the point I want to make is like, you know, that was sort of um, the start of your rugby journey. Um, you're a student, you know, having a huge amount of fun, and and um, you know, you got to live a bit of a life, and that's not something that maybe some of your contemporaries get to do because they're been straight into out of school and and straight into effectively academies and and. Um, development stuff and, and pro- effectively professional rugby. But my, my point is, which I'm going to get to, is that you've got a great group of mates from your uni days outside of rugby that, you know, have, you know, you've got WhatsApp groups, gentlemen's clubs, they've put together, you know, funds on the side to come and watch you play, you know, international yes. rugby. I mean, that's through the ups and downs of a rugby career, that's got to be pretty cool to have that that other group of mates outside of footy. You've no doubt keep you grounded they've seen you at your best and at your worst no doubt you know as a young man like that that's pretty cool isn't it and and not something the modern rugby player has as much as you know you got you're super tight with a lot of the Chiefs boys but you've got these other groups as well that that um you're tight with as well yeah I feel very very blessed that I've been able to live the life that I have so far and um certainly with the balance um like I say with with my uni mates and then with my professional rugby mates as well it's it's very it's yeah it's very cool and I, like it's great for the young boys now that they get to train and straight out of high school they get to be professionals and get paid straight away but they you know they lose that sort of life experience of what going, what being at uni is like or what you know doing a little trade is like and if, it, if, if the system was like it is now back when I was leaving high school like maybe I never become yeah an all black in fact it, probably likely because there's no way I'm getting a national development contract to train with the yeah, super rugby team. Yes, yes. I wasn't good enough. Yeah. So, um, and then like you say, like the, like the mates that I've made through, um, through uni who have just been, have been really good at like, I guess, keeping, keeping me grounded as well. And just like, have, you know, having, I guess a life outside of rugby, I can just go and talk to those guys. Cause there's, yeah. you know, they just do, um, you know, normal jobs or have businesses and stuff. And, um, you know, they're not caught up in, in the rugby thing. And it, the great thing was, um, and tw- yeah, like you sort of say that, that gentleman's club that we've, we've sort of got, um, a whole bunch of lads, they all saved up, um, and come to the world cup in 2019. There was about, I want to say there was like maybe 12 or 13 of them How there good. in How 2019 good. and, yeah, good. You know, I'm there playing and they're all what they're coming to the games and watching and having fun in between. And I remember um they had a they had their own capping ceremony. It was brilliant. <laughs> they got these like women's club um caps made up. And I brought Beaver 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 was there at um oh, World Cup working. who's doing yep. Spark. And so I dragged him along with me and we went to um it was at this like yakiniku restaurant and then um beaver presented them all with their, <laughs> their, their <tour. laughs> so uh, it was brilliant so like i so like 
Beaver just bless his heart, like yeah. went out of his way to, to come. He didn't, he didn't know any of my mates. Yeah, he just, yeah, I just yeah. asked him to come. And he loved. He, uh, he stayed and had a few beers with with, with my mates. And um, he gets a they, beaver. Uh, like he gets that yeah, stuff. He gets. He, he gets club rugby. He gets you know like always wants to help sort of every fan or facet of of rugby. And you're you're a bit like that too, mate. Which is <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, bless him, mate. Uh, the, I think there was. I uh, well, no doubt there was a few other highlights uh, for those lads, but off. Most of it, I think, was um, getting to meet the great man Beeve and having him present their cap. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty special. <laughs> good, <laughs> mate. Uh, let's talk about the year gone by. Like, um, I've no doubt you put in the same amount of work and energy and effort into trying to make the All Blacks in 2023 and go to another World Cup. Even though you know maybe you thought 2019 was going to be your last chance. You know, similar things in the sense that you're playing great code. The Chiefs play great, great code. Like, um, you know, we talk about the ups and downs, but you must have been hugely disappointed not to make the side because. You know, from the average fan, you weren't doing much different than you had any other year. Um, you know, you're playing good footy and the Chiefs were playing good footy. But, you know, at times, well, not at times, all the time, these things are out of your hands. You do your best you can. You put your best foot forward and and then um, it's up to others to decide um, what the makeup of the squad is. Like, um, you know, is that perhaps, um, you know, one of the more disappointing moments in your career? I, I suppose it has to be. Yeah, mate. It's like I, I suppose when you put it all together, it, it is. Uh, it was really disappointing. I, like you say, I was. I felt like it was probably the year of of rugby that I was playing my most complete. Um, yeah. Like uh, I probably didn't have as many highlight plays as I might have had in twenty nineteen, but in terms of um, running game, running our game plan at the Chiefs, and and just doing, I guess, overall everything really well consistently. I think uh, it was probably my most consistent season. Um, and then like what we spoke about before, like having got a few opportunities, especially in 2021 and really feeling like um, I had a lot to get a lot to give at international rugby and felt like I belonged there. Um, you know, I felt like I'd, I'd earned it, but I guess what, what I learned, uh, you know, leading into that 2019 season was that I'm just going to yeah. worry about me and play as, try and play as well as I, well as I can and do my best for the chiefs and, you know, ultimately selections out of my hands. So there's nothing much I can do about it. And while I was disappointed yet, um, you know, mate, it's the, it's the way it goes. Not everybody gets their, their fairy tale ending as much as they like it. And, you know, I've been very lucky that um, I've, I've played 18 times for the All Blacks. Like it's yeah. more than more than I ever thought and more than a lot of guys ever do. And, you know, like I, I catch up with obviously my Gareth Evans, my best mate who played one test for the All Blacks and, um, has kind of been forced to to put things aside through injury, so like that kind of puts things into perspective. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. could could be worse. And I've and I've had a great career, mate. I've um I've I've done absolutely everything I could have ever hope for. To be honest, I yeah. went to a World Cup, started big tests, um, fifty you know, for Hawks some... Bay, hundred for the Chiefs. Like you've you've yeah. done it all, brother. Played for the Sharks, dominated the uh, Dunedin Shark Clubhouse. You know, like done it all. Yeah, so exactly. So when I look, when I sit back in a pub one day and look back, I'll be, I'll be so proud. I won't even remember not making the All Blacks in twenty twenty three. And um, you know, while I was disappointed, mate, like in the long run, shit. Yeah, there's a lot worse out there, and I've uh, oh, it's mate. been it's been such it's been so much fun. Ah, uh, mate, you've been one of the great characters and servants to New Zealand rugby. And I suppose let's finish on what's next, mate. What does the final chapter look like? You're there. At start, are you signed for one, two years? What does that look like? Um, are you enjoying it? Are you going to get home straight away and we're going to put together the, the Brad Weber show and, and that's going to take off? You know, what does it all look like? Yes, yeah, so I'm signed for three years, mate. So um, oh, cool. 32 now, 33 in January. So yep. um, so I'll be 35 once this one uh, finishes. And, you know, the reason I wanted to come over here was like, like we were saying, literally just before, is like, I'm still playing really good rugby. Yeah. So I still want, I want to test myself. I want to be competitive in a good league, and this is if it's not New Zealand, then I think this is the best place to do that. Um, to keep testing myself, see how you know. Ultimately, I want to see how good of a rugby player I can be, and I still feel like I'll, I'm getting better and can do more. So that's the plan, mate. Just to see these three years out. And to be honest, at this stage, if you're asking me, um, after that, mate, I'm going to hang the boots up after after the three years is done. Thirty five, I think that'll be be time. Uh, my partner's a doctor in in, uh, in New Zealand, so um, probably time for her to stop chasing yeah, me yeah. around, and, and probably be me time for me to to chase her around and 
uh, let her do her, her thing. And then, uh, yeah, maybe I'll hopefully get into some some TV, get the Brad yeah. Weber show up and run yeah, on NZR Plus or Sky or something, uh, maybe something like that. That's that's uh, probably the plan at the moment, mate. Awesome. Good on you, mate. Thank you for joining us. Good luck over there. Like you say, it's a, it's a phenomenally um, competitive league. We actually see a lot more of it now than we used to. It's on Sky a lot and can sort of keep up with things and how you're going. So good luck because I know um, there's some huge fixes. Hope you go deep into the top 14 season. Hope you go really deep into the you know, the European Cup or the Champions Cup, whatever they call it. But um, and, and no doubt cross paths with quite a few Kiwis and other internationals and rip it up. Thank you for giving us, you know, darn near a couple of hours of your time, brother. And, and um, yeah, look forward to catching up maybe in a year or two and, and touching base and seeing how it's all going. Uh, no worries. Anything for you, Randy? You're a top man. <laughs> Thank you, Webby. Appreciate it, mate. The All Blacks podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black be the best run in sports. Hosted by Rob Dunn in the Hargrave Street Studio. Produced by Carl Thompson from Blue and Ginge, the podcast producers. Video editing by Mac Leesberg, graphics by Western Design, content advising from Andy Burt, and commercial manager for the podcast is Valeska Hoth. Follow the All Blacks podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcasts.